The summer house that Charlotte Evans came to stay in belongs to her father's family. Charlotte's mother never went there, and her father hadn't returned to his family's home for many years. Both were gone, and Charlotte was now alone, an only child. Her aunt on her father's side had offered the place to Charlotte as a means of experiencing a moment of respite before beginning her graduate studies later in the fall. I don't like leaving you here by yourself, especially with no way to drive into town, Charlotte's friend Amelia reminded her. I know we've already talked this over, but I still don't like it. Amelia put one of Charlotte's bags on the floor of the house's antiquated kitchen and looked around the compact space. Though the small room was clean and tidy, the kitchen sink and other fixtures were something from decades past, their surfaces dull and tarnished with age. Isolation is what I crave right now, Charlotte said, sighing as she parted the kitchen curtains, rays of sunlight flooding in. Sometimes, I couldn't even get out of the bed after my breakup with Ben. I just needed to be alone. No offense. She sat down at the kitchen table and began rummaging through one of the brown paper grocery bags nearby, placed there by Amelia. Amelia stood by the open door, the pleasant sounds of the woods and early summer ambient in the background. Will you have enough food for three months? Amelia asked, frowning as she opened a kitchen cabinet door, taking out a blue and white box and reading its side. She commented, I couldn't drink powdered milk. Yuck. I hope you don't starve. I'll be fine, Charlotte reassured her, as if dismissing a petulant child. I think that's all the bags. Thanks for helping me with shopping in town. Charlotte took two cans from the grocery bag and stood next to Amelia, putting them in the cabinet with the powdered milk. I've got enough food to last until the end of the summer. If I really need to get to town, I can walk. It'll take hours, but I can do it. What if you can't walk? Amelia retorted hastily. The phone here isn't even hooked up. Amelia leaned against the kitchen counter as Charlotte continued to stash away canned groceries. It's a risk I'm willing to take, Charlotte replied. I'm young and fit. What could possibly happen to me? She grasped the door into the kitchen and then put an arm around Amelia, hugging her for a moment. I'll see you in eight three days. You have a good summer on the water with Ethan. I'm sorry I won't be able to go boating with you two this time. Charlotte put a hand above her eye, shading them from the bright afternoon sunlight to watch Amelia drive away. A dirt and gravel driveway led away from the two-story colonial-style house, a paved road then connecting the house to town. A copse of sweeping ash trees hid the house which stood alone on its own wooded lot with no close neighbors in either direction. Wandering in the woods behind the house, Charlotte decided to let the rest of the groceries sit in their bags for a while. Everything perishable had already been put away in the refrigerator. Charlotte would have to do without anything fresh once those supplies were gone unless she felt like taking a long walk to town. The woods were quiet and tranquil, with chirping birds and soft rustling of leaves in the wind. She strolled along a narrow, deeper path that eventually opened to a clearing. In its center stretched a large pond, broad and stagnant, its opposite side lined by dense woods. Looking out over the pond from its sandy shore, Charlotte noticed how murky the waters appeared. Little sunlight made it to the surface. It must be very deep in the center, Charlotte thought, watching the wind churn over the water, tumbling white clouds drifting overhead. I'll come back later and take another look. The old house seemed to breathe as Charlotte walked up its steps, groaning as she opened the front door. I'm glad Aunt Alice keeps this place in decent shape, thought Charlotte. I'll have to visit the elderly couple she employs when I'm in town again, probably in a few weeks. The house's attic was cramped, filled with musty furniture, boxes and a worn steamer trunk, a broken strap dangling from its side. Charlotte had waited until morning to visit the upstairs attic and explore its treasures. She'd been too tired after the long drive with Amelia yesterday. Opening the trunk, Charlotte began to dig through its contents, putting aside threadbare vintage clothing and leather-bound books. At last, she picked up an old photo album. I wonder why Aunt Alice doesn't just throw most of this stuff out, Charlotte asked herself as she turned the dusty pages of the album. The clothes are just a feast for the moths at this point. The photo album held pictures of her extended family from years ago, including people she didn't recognize. Charlotte found photos of her father from when he was a boy and then a young man. He'd grown up in this house before moving away just like his siblings. The black and white photos were sometimes discolored 
and there were several empty spaces in the album, as if photos had been taken out. Putting the book aside, Charlotte took the last of the clothes out of the trunk, something falling out as she did. She reached down to pick up a photo from the floor and examined it. Its picture was of her father standing next to a young, pretty woman. He was smiling. In the background was the house as it would have been many years earlier. Turning the photo over, someone had written Warren and Matilda and then marked it with a date. Looks like Dad had a girlfriend before Mom, Charlotte mused to herself. I don't remember Mom or Dad ever mentioning a Matilda. Charlotte tucked the faded, heavily creased photo into the back of the photo album and then tried to put everything back into the trunk in its original order. I hope Aunt Alice doesn't notice. Like she'll even check. Rising from the trunk, Charlotte climbed back downstairs to check the mail, closing the attic door above her. Aunt Alice said I should collect it for her while I'm here. She opened the front door and walked along the driveway to the sheltering trees and the mailbox hanging from a post near the road. She pried open the mailbox's lid and found nothing inside. Someone was coming up the road on a bicycle. As the cyclist grew closer, Charlotte could see it was a young woman wearing a summer dress. The young woman waved a hand and then brought her bicycle to a stop near the mailbox, resting her sneakered feet on the pavement. Good morning, the woman said gladly, smiling at Charlotte. It looks like the old place has a guest. I'm here for a while, Charlotte replied, returning the woman's smile as best as she could. House sitting for my aunt, Alice. Nobody lives here anymore, and my aunt wanted the house occupied before it's sold. Are you from town? Charlotte studied the woman as she waited for an answer. She was naturally beautiful with flowing honey-colored hair and striking green eyes. A real knockout. I'm not from town, but I am from around here, the woman answered, still smiling and genial. Charlotte considered this answer somewhat puzzling. What's your name? the woman said. Charlotte Evans, pleased to meet you. Charlotte held out her hand, but the woman only continued to grip her bicycle's handlebars. I knew a boy named Evans once, a long time ago, the woman said quietly, her smile fading. She turned away from Charlotte for a moment and looked behind her, as if examining the house. And who are you? May I know your name? Charlotte asked, almost insisting, feeling a sudden discomfort at the break in the conversation. Without a word, the woman began to pedal off. She didn't turn back or offer an explanation. She just rode silently away. Charlotte watched her glide down the road, her bike bell lightly chiming. Finally, the woman disappeared around a winding curve gone beyond the leafy trees. Bewildered, Charlotte returned to the house to make lunch, thinking she'd pick up again with her summer reading list in the evening. She briefly paused, wondering why a young woman would be riding such an old-fashioned bike. The fireplace crackled the only source of light in the living room other than the lamp next to Charlotte's armchair. Charlotte turned a page in her hardback book, nodding for a moment beneath the fireplace's soothing warmth. The night outside was cool. It was still early summer. When the professor had gone, Sergei Ivanovich turned to his brother. After reading the first sentence of the new chapter, Charlotte yawned, thinking, I can't finish this chapter tonight. Maybe tomorrow. Resting the book on the side table, Charlotte then heard a floorboard creak upstairs, followed by the sound of soft footsteps. A dull thud echoed from the stairs to the floor below, as if someone just put their weight onto its steps. Squinting in the low light of the room, Charlotte glanced cautiously towards the living room's open door. More footsteps echoed in the hallway, and then a shadow fell over the entrance. Someone was there, standing in the hall, waiting. Charlotte's lamplight dimmed and flickered, the fireplace's flames dwindled behind her. Hello? I know you're there, Charlotte said, now standing in front of her chair. She reached for a fireplace poker and held it firmly, ready to confront her intruder. There was a mournful sigh and a breeze gushed through the room. Its odor fetid and decayed, smelling subtly of Finlan. The shadow then receded, pulling back into the dark of the hallway until it finally vanished. Charlotte hurried toward the light switch on the wall and slapped it on. The ceiling lamp bathed the room in bright light. No one was there. Poker in hand, Charlotte checked the upstairs bedrooms and then searched the ground floor of the house. Turning on the kitchen lights, she scrutinized the nighttime yard from the front porch and then locked the front and side doors. I was almost asleep, Charlotte thought, trying to reassure herself, her uneasiness still palpable. It was just a dream. I'm all alone out here. 
Charlotte put the keys into her jeans pocket and then checked her billfold for the cash she had brought with her. The walk to town will likely take three or more hours, Charlotte determined. It's a sunny day, and I can make an excursion of it, but I should have asked Amelia to put her bike in the car trunk for me. I'm just too independent for my own good, I guess. She walked to the back of the house, deciding she might find an old bicycle in the house's root cellar. I haven't looked here, Charlotte thought as she pulled open its swinging double doors and stepped inside. The root cellar was dry and lined with jars resting on wooden shelves. Charlotte carefully descended the short set of stairs to the earthen floor and began to search around. The cellar was dark. She could find no suspended light bulb, but the midday sun streaming from the open door supplied enough light. Against the far wall leaned a rusted bicycle, a wire basket affixed it to its front. Standing over the antique bike, Charlotte thought it seemed oddly familiar. It finally came to her. It looked the same as the bicycle of that strange girl she had seen a few weeks ago. Charlotte touched the corroded bell on the left handlebar, finding that it still rang. This isn't going to get me to town, Charlotte concluded. I'll just have to walk. Closing the cellar door behind her, Charlotte joined the road and made a steady pace on foot to her destination. Aunt Alice had given Charlotte the address of the couple who had been keeping her house since last year, asking that Charlotte check in with them at least once during her visit. When she finally arrived, Charlotte found that the small town was clustered around a charming main street peppered with shops. It ended with a white and gray church, its roof formed into a steeple. Charlotte found a side street that led to several rows of small houses, their exteriors all alike. The elderly couple lived in a cottage past the houses in the town's outskirts. The cottage was tiny, barely large enough for two people, but quaint and cozy. Charlotte stood on the front steps and knocked on the door. A withered old woman answered, short and white-haired. Hello, young lady. How may I help you? She asked, her smile kindly but vacant. I'm Charlotte Evans, Alice Evanson's niece, Charlotte replied. I've been staying at the house these past weeks. Aunt Alice asked me to check in with you once I got settled in. Yes, Charlotte, we've been waiting for you. Please come in the woman said, stepping away from the open door. Meet my husband, Charles. An elderly man stooped and walked stiffly, stopping at the end of the hall. He waved for a moment and then shuffled away, seemingly preoccupied. Charles helps me with the house when he can, the woman said, her tone plaintive. But some days he's like this. Neither one of us has much time left. But come in. Stepping inside, Charlotte saw that the home was well kept and pleasantly decorated with decades worth of family heirloom, treasured keepsakes, and portrait photographs filling the living room. The woman slipped into the nearby kitchen and soon returned with porcelain teacups and a teapot resting on a tray. She set the tray on the low table in front of Charlotte. As the woman poured Charlotte a cup of hot tea, she said, I'm Iris, by the way. I've known your aunt for many years. She and your father attended school in Winslow. I worked in the school cafeteria, you see. I've lived in Winslow my whole life. Pleased to meet you, Iris, Charlotte said, noticing that Charles was now nowhere to be seen. I hadn't really seen much of Aunt Alice until a few years ago, when Dad passed away. Yes, Alice had told us about that. Such a shame, Iris said, her eyes sad. What about your mother? She was from Winslow as well, you know. Mom's gone as well. Sometime before Dad, Charlotte replied, her voice full of regret. She was taken away by a freak accident, not an illness. I always thought that I'd see them grow old together, but it wasn't to be. Iris poured herself a cup of tea and then took a sip. Your father rarely came back to Winslow after he married your mother, Iris said, her tone becoming steadier. He lost his first love here, long before her. I suppose that was his reason. Who was that? Charlotte queried. Her interest suddenly peaked. Mom and Dad never talked about their early years in this small town. I guess they just wanted to forget about it after moving away and creating a new life for themselves. That's a shame, my dear, Iris answered. When he was a young man, your father loved a girl named Matilda Graves. They were planning to be wed, but just before the wedding, she vanished, disappeared without a trace. People in town said it was cold feet. But I never believed any of it, Iris confided. 
Everything she had ever known was in Winslow, and she loved her father more than anything else. Matilda would often talk of the children they would have someday. She's still listed as a missing person as I understand it. Charlotte thought back to the photograph she had seen in the attic trunk. Her father with a young woman, the name Matilda written on its back. Asking quickly, Charlotte said, Then how did Dad ever meet my mom if he was to be married to someone else? They must have gotten together soon after. They did? Iris replied, her answer sharp. Audrey swooped in and soon they were dating again. They married shortly after. Your mother had been Warren's steady girlfriend for a while before his engagement to Matilda. Well, I don't know what to say, Charlotte said, finishing her cup of tea. But, like I told you, Mom and Dad seldom discussed their hometown. They were distant, almost absentee parents in many ways. There was a silence. Both women peered into their teacups, neither looking at the other. Well, Charlotte finally said, breaking the silence. Thank you for the tea. It was lovely. Will you be stopping by sometime this summer? Yes, certainly, my dear, Iris answered, seemingly happy to change the subject. I'll bring Charles with me if he's able. We'll drive up to the house. I'm not a young thing like you, you know. Iris saw Charlotte to the door and waved as the younger woman walked away. Charlotte found her way to Main Street and then the path home. It was late afternoon and the sun would be setting by the time she arrived back at the house. The early summer leaves shaded Charlotte as she ampled along the roadside. Her light canvas sneakers were dusty from her long walk and her arm ached from carrying the bag of groceries. Charlotte was tired, surprised that the slow-paced journey to and from town had taken so much out of her. The sun had become burnt orange. It sank slowly below the trees, shielding the road from the horizon. Far ahead in the opposite lane, a bicycle sped toward her. The rider looked like a woman, but Charlotte couldn't quite make her out. The bicycle's bell chimed once and then again, as if warning pedestrians of its arrival. Charlotte turned to follow the rider as she rolled past, finally able to see the woman's face in the dimming light. The young woman's features were pallid white, like an alabaster death mask. She stared fixedly ahead, not glancing at Charlotte as she rode past. It was as if she was entirely unaware of her presence. The bicycle hastened away, eventually vanishing into the shadows of the first hours of the evening. Shaken, Charlotte thought, that looked like the girl I met at the mailbox, but she looked strange, like she was sick. As soon as she got home, Charlotte went to sleep exhausted by her exertions. Tomorrow, she would try to find out more about Matilda Graves. Charlotte frowned at the studied picture of her father with a young woman. It's the same girl, she thought, the one I saw at the mailbox on the bike. But it can't be. The picture is decades old. Putting the photo away, Charlotte climbed down from the attic to explore the woods behind the house again, hoping to clear her mind. The pond was as she had left it, luring with scores of lily pads and lines of thin foam floating by its banks. For the first time, Charlotte noticed a moss-covered rowboat, its oars missing, propped up against a tree not far from the pond. The rowboat seemed as if it hadn't been used for many years, but Charlotte supposed it had probably once taken short trips on the water. The pond was large after all, almost a small lake. The wind rustled across the water, causing waves to cascade towards the shore. Charlotte then heard her name on the wind. Someone was calling out to her. Charlotte, the voice whispered. It sounded both distant and intimate. Her name again. Charlotte. It was a woman's voice, but Charlotte was alone by the water. Near the pond's unfathomed center, a white shape formed. Slowly, it drifted toward the shore. Charlotte peered ahead, the overcast day offering nothing. As the shape came closer, it began to rise from the water. First a head wearing a veil appeared, then a woman's midsection, and finally, wading through the shallows, a woman wearing a full white wedding dress. The woman moved towards Charlotte steadily, her expression partially concealed by the veil. But as far as Charlotte could tell, it was unimaginably malevolent. Charlotte opened her eyes, seeing the star-filled sky above her. 
The evening was very still with a bright full moon bathing the grass and leaves nearby with a soft glow. The sky was no longer cloudy as it had been before. Sitting up, Charlotte realized that she was somehow in the woods, the pond no longer in view. Where? The water. Her head pounding, she stood and peered around. With a wave of relief, she spied the house, its roof jutting distantly through a tangle of trees. Within minutes, Charlotte had reached the front steps and pushed open the door. She heard voices coming from the kitchen. Charlotte stood at the kitchen's threshold and stared, horror-struck. Two women were seated at the kitchen table, a tea service between them. One was her mother as a young woman, and the other was Matilda Graves. They were engaged in a friendly dialogue. I'm so glad you could come over to discuss the wedding, Charlotte's mother said amiably. Warren couldn't be here as he had to help his parents in town. They'll be back tonight. I'm pleased, but I'll have to get going soon, Matilda said. It's still a far ride back to town on my bike. Warren had a list of things we need to take care of before the big day. Did he leave it with you? Why, yes, Charlotte's mother replied. It's right here. Finish your tea and we'll discuss it. She placed a few sheets of paper in front of Matilda and then excused herself for a moment. When she came back, Matilda complained of feeling drowsy. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, dear, Charlotte's mother said, a smile forming on her curved lips. Perhaps you need to lie down? That's a good idea, Matilda said, nodding. Just for a moment, then I'll be fine. Charlotte's mother helped Matilda to her feet, embracing her with one arm. No hard feelings, then? Matilda asked, pausing to look Charlotte's mother in the face. You and Warren didn't work out, but we love each other so much. You want him to be happy, don't you? Charlotte's mother was silent as the two stood before the kitchen table and then replied, Of course. That's why Warren will be with me instead. Matilda grew dizzy and began to swoon, falling against Charlotte's mother. Charlotte's mother pushed her away, letting Matilda fall to the floor with a crash. Lying on her side, Matilda weakly attempted to grasp something with which to pull herself up. Charlotte's mother stood over her wordlessly and then walked out of the room. She returned with a large trunk sporting thick leather handles. You'll fit in if I fold you in, Charlotte's mother told Matilda, her words drenched in venom. But I'm going to take this out to that pond first. Don't you go anywhere. <laughs> Not that you can. The specters faded, and Charlotte heard the ladder to the attic descend with a loud thud. Almost in a trance, Charlotte left the kitchen and stood before the attic's ladder. Slowly, she reached out and began to haul herself up. The steamer trunk was closed. Charlotte stood by the hatch, unmoving, tears forming in her eyes. Slowly, the trunk's lid began to yawn open. There was a pause. A terrible silence filled the dark space. A hand shot from the trunk. The fingers distended and claw-like. Charlotte flinched but didn't move. Foul water began to pour from the trunk, forming pools and rivulets around Charlotte's feet. Matilda rose jerkily, her wedding veil flat against her mottled skin, her eyes bulging, her face bloated and decomposed. Charlotte remained in her spot, paralyzed with fear. She could only watch as Matilda stepped from the trunk and in slow, loping strides drew closer. Charlotte could feel the ghost's chill breath on her bare neck. Matilda leaned in, and in a voice like dead leaves, whispered something in Charlotte's ear. The sheriff looked down at Iris, who stood next to the attic's ladder below him. She wore a worried expression that changed to one of shock when the sheriff spoke to her. She's up here, ma'am. She's been dead for at least a few days, given the state of this corpse. I'm coming back down to call the coroner. Iris stepped aside as the sheriff climbed down. Curtly, he folded the ladder back up and then closed the attic's hatch. There's no need for you to be here, Mrs. Martin. There's nothing you can do for Miss Evans now. We'll take your statement in town. Night fell over the empty house, its doors locked and bolted from the outside. The winds rippled over the pond's surface, its waters darkish and foreboding. From within the attic, the sound of sobbing cut through the dark agonized and afraid. They were coming from the closed steamer trunk, its last memento collected.